Welcome to a special series of our conversations on African philanthropy with me, Pieginko Smoyo, the director of the Center on African Philanthropy and Social Investment. We are shooting this special episode at the margins of the East Africa Philanthropy Network Conference in Zanzibar. For the next couple of episodes, you will be hearing from participants sharing on systems change and other forms of philanthropy. Enjoy the series. Capsi Podcast Series, Conversations on African Philanthropy. Before you started, yeah. my first interview when I joined this place was in South Africa. And I remember being asked, what for it's not true philanthropy? So you say it for the <laughs> Let's start. Who has asked you that? Uh, it was one of your people, no, stigmatized people. <laughs> and it was my first time reading about results. <laughs> I gave an answer that to date. I laugh about it. <laughs> but the great thing is, those who are editing that video realized I was too old. They removed that <laughs> Welcome to yet another episode on conversations on African philanthropy. I'm joined uh, by Evans Okinyi, uh, the director of the East Africa Philanthropy Network. We happen to be shooting this episode at the margins of the East African Philanthropy Conference here in Zanzibar. Uh, Evans, welcome to the conversations. Thank you so much. <coughs> Let's start with uh, what you, <laughs> you were asked in South Africa. <laughs> what is horizontal <laughs> philanthropy? Oh my goodness. Let, let's start there. Let's start this thing again. <laughs> no, we are not starting. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, that was a funny uh, incident. But... Um, I think horizontal philanthropy is the major philanthropy that we practice in this continent. It's the philanthropy practiced by communities. It's the philanthropy that takes place at that local level. And I always say it's the true definition of African giving. I think the institutions which um, we are currently engaged in, for a very long time, philanthropy in this <coughs> continent was not institutionalized. So the vertical philanthropy that we see now taking shape and um, <coughs> really getting bigger and bolder um, is as a result of um, the huge base of giving that is taking place at communities, uh, which is uh, what we are terming as horizontal philanthropy. And so... Um, I think if you allow me, I know you did not ask this, but if you allow me to just step back a little bit. Um, I'm looking forward to the days when, as a continent, we will drive the development agenda with our own resources, using our own resources to address the local challenges that we have, and having ourselves sit on the driving table. So the localization of philanthropy as an arm of development um, to me uh, really needs to go back to the traditions which we've had for a very long time yeah. and really nurture them and use them to build the future that we are looking at. Yeah. So we are meeting here and you are at the helm of the East Africa Philanthropy Network yeah. and the, 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 the theme of the conference is systems transformation yeah. catalyzing collective action. I think there's no better person than you to lay out uh, in terms of what we, you seek to achieve, uh, firstly as the secretariat, but also uh, as the membership of the East Africa Philanthropy Network. I mean, you have drawn so many people uh, here. Some of them are not even your members. Um, what is it that you seek to achieve, firstly as a network, and then secondly, uh, what you want to get out of this conference. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Prof. Um, when we left the um, APN Assembly in Kampala last year, we looked at the conversations which were going on in Kampala 
And uh, when we started this year, we had a lengthy talk with our members. And of course, we normally consult <coughs> with the other stakeholders that we work with, uh, from the private sector, from within civil society, and some from the government side. And what we found out from the survey that we conducted was that uh, people needed a change in, <coughs> or rather transformation in the systems that are uh, 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 that are shaping and controlling the sector that we are serving. Just within the sector itself, and of course with its <coughs> interactions with the other sectors uh, uh, of, of development. And uh, the second thing that came out was um, the need for us to transform those systems in a collective manner. <coughs> and so we really struggled with the theme of the conference because we wanted to look at something that would bring these two ends together. Yeah. The transformation of systems and the collective action in addressing those transformations. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and so we arrived at the theme of the conference, uh, which is what is convening us here now. What came out from um, that interaction that we had with the members uh, was the need for us to really build a movement within the sector of philanthropy, <clears throat> a movement that will champion the cause around transformation of systems, a move that will ensure that <clears throat> the organizations that we are looking at within the philanthropy space and the others that we interact with, which are major within the East Africa region, really undertake that responsibility in a collective manner. For a very long time, we've talked about collaboration as a sector. Uh, we've talked about, you know, the SDGs goal number 17, the need for us to break silos and really work together. But you and me know that uh, that has not been easy. It is more on paper than it is in practical yeah. sense. And so we wanted to really demonstrate and really uh, set off a momentum that will allow us to really embrace collaboration as an aspect uh, uh, within the works that we are doing. And so we started reaching out to um, <clears throat> one, our members of course, and we were very intentional in terms of crafting the agenda of the conference. If you look at the conversations that we have had today, they are more about the broader issues which are affecting the space. Yeah. You look at the ecosystem, the legal policy infrastructure, communities being at the center of these conversations that we are having, governance um, uh, as an element, as a practice, you know, towards strengthening organizations, um, amongst many other things. So the conversation that we are having today was more broader while looking at the sector at large. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow we want to go into the specific elements, uh, this, the, the ingredients that enable that system to roll. And so we have many players within that space, and there are also many other practices that are within that space. And so we'll be looking at, you know, the role that the youths have to play in this. We want to see uh, the role that the high net worth individuals have to play in this conversation. Uh, we want to see the role that communities are playing in this uh, 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 conversation. And then we want to see how we can also embrace other best practices around, for example, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And of course, then day three, we want to combine the conversations which are taking place on day one, <clears throat> plus what we are having on day two tomorrow, to now catalyze collective action behind specific uh, action points, which we yeah. can rally behind <clears throat> as a sector. And so we feel that this is what the sector needs. And it's not something that is going to happen all at once. Uh, we've got to initiate the momentum and then really hope that we will build around it. I think one thing that has made me so happy <coughs> is the level of um, interest that we have seen while organizing this yeah. conference. I yeah. can tell you that um, by the end of the month of April, all the program of the conference was full. Yeah. We had 126 uh, session uh, proposals that came in against what we needed, which was 36 in number. Yeah. So even sieving through and just uh, agreeing that this is what we are going to do, uh, and that's why you see the conference agenda, there's no single organization which had an opportunity to really organize a session alone. Yeah. We had to now bring people <coughs> together and alike um, um, <coughs> uh, conversations and topics and issues which are affecting yeah. the space. Yeah. So I think, Prof, uh, for us, that is what we are looking at. And uh, the end result that we see is... Um, 
we want to see vibrant philanthropy. And for us, vibrancy is around, um, from the simplest of it, runs from advocacy. Yeah. We feel that if we can build a strong network of the organizations which are uh, within the East Africa Philanthropy Network, and those ones which we are working with in partnership, for example, CAPSI, um, uh, Epic Africa, the Africa Philanthropy Network, Trust Africa, all those other entities. Then we come together and we use the bottom-up approach to the work that we are doing, where we strengthen the regions and then at the continental level, leverage on the strengths of those regions yeah. to then push <coughs> the continental agenda, I think and believe that it will be good for us. So advocacy here means <coughs> having a strong voice as a sector, so that we can get the seats in decision-making tables. I think for a very long time, at the legislative uh, level, philanthropy plays a fiddle, yeah. you know? Yeah. At the implementation level, we really are not intentional, uh, uh, not entirely, things are changing, in our collaboration with the government. <coughs> We talk about our collaboration with the private sector. I think and feel that this is the time and the right time and the right moment for us to really be intentional about those collaborations around that tripartite, about the tripartite um, uh, working relationships that we've always yeah. talked about. Yeah. So from advocacy to, and, and, and still on, while still on advocacy, it's, it's, it's why we are bringing out the angle of collective action. We want to build a movement, a movement that is strong, a movement that has a voice, a movement that can catalyze collective action, a movement that can be listened to at yeah. the national, yeah. continental, and global level. Yeah. And that is why if you look at the program, <clears throat> we intentionally brought in some of the policies which the AU has passed, for example, around the youth. Yeah. For a long time, we had conversations about the youth, but they were not pegged on existing policies. So we want to see how we can align our interventions to existing policies and where there are gaps within those policies, we use the voice that we have as a sector, as a movement to change so that we can leverage on the same to build a stronger um, yeah. uh, stronger growth. Yeah, so so before we started, you were telling us a joke about your interview, Yeah. about somebody asking you about what is horizontal philanthropy and we, we laughed about it yeah. and in the beginning we also, we also joked about it. But I suppose what 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 that analogy does is to show you the extent to which something starts at a at a level where there might be very little understanding mm. of what it is. Mm. In your case, you said you know your people have even edited that answer out. Mm. But over time, you know you get to mature in mm. it and you get to really capture what that means or even be able to implement. Mm. And the same here seems to be the trend. For example, with East Africa. Philanthropy Network, which formerly was the East Africa Grand Makers Association, mm -hmm. to what it is today. So can you take us maybe through the different moments and stages that you have gone through mm -hmm. as a network? Because you are at your strongest now. Um, but oh. several years back, you were not. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe let's just take a, a, a journey mm -hmm. around those different moments. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, there's nothing that really connects me to EAPN than the history that it has. Yeah. Uh, when I joined EAPN, it was the East Africa Association of Grant Makers. And I joined when um, we had a membership of uh, 24 organizations. And I used to ask myself, I never asked my boss then, but I used to ask myself, if we are East African with all these countries, why are we not like... Uh, a huge number, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, organizations, yeah. and we are serving <clears throat> like three countries. Yeah. And I thought it was easy until one day um, uh, I was in the position where my boss was in. And I said, I, I used to see it from fine. I'm like, if I have this opportunity, this is what I will do. Of course, we tried doing those things yeah. because one of the things that you've got to do, uh, we really have a culture of teamwork at EAPN. So, the thoughts, the strategies that we had around mobilizing for membership, uh, we used to share them in the staff meeting and action on them, but they were not working. We were not seeing people joining the membership. When my, uh, my, my, my boss uh, transitioned to another network, 
and I had an opportunity to take uh, the leadership of the organization, I saw quite a number of challenges which were in the organization and our relationship uh, with the outside uh, stakeholders that we were engaging yeah. with. And the first thing that we did was to review our strategic plan and just see whether we were really meeting the demands of the sector within the philanthropy space as a sector, but also with the other agents of development. Mm -hmm. And what we did was to look into that strategy. And what we found out was um, there were a lot of organizations which were feeling excluded just by the virtue that we were called an association of grant makers. Yeah. They felt that philanthropy is beyond grant making. While talking about grant making, you're also you're really looking at funders. And even within the funders category, specific group of funders. Yeah. Yeah. And so we asked ourselves, how do we then make the organization to be more inclusive, to be more reflective of the true nature, feel, taste of philanthropy at that particular yeah. moment? Yeah. And that was like uh, five or five, six years ago when that conversation uh, took shape. And so we brought um, 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 a resolution to the board after consulting with the members, the other stakeholders, uh, that we needed to be more inclusive. Bigger philanthropy is taking place at the community level. Yeah. We have those who are at the community level as implementing agencies. We have the intermediaries which are existing in this ecosystem. And then we had the donor community, which are, you know, at that top level. And so when we took it to the board that uh, we felt that we needed to rename and rebrand the organization yeah. Yeah. from our value proposition to the name, <clears throat> to the target communities that we were looking at. And so we, 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 uh, the, the board saw the sense. We had a few oppositions within the board, but um, uh, they saw the sense. And so that, that resolution was ratified. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the turning point for the organization. Yeah. I remember over the last five years, we have done in terms of membership what we could not do in 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. We moved the membership now that currently stands at close to 80 organizations. Yeah. Yeah. When I picked it up, it was 24 uh, organizations. And you can see that growth yeah. is a result of one, uh, members feeling that they are now getting value uh, for their money, which was is very important. But also the other stakeholders seeing the importance of being part of the yeah. network, yeah. especially around okay. learning, around sharing of knowledge, around um, uh, connecting with peers, around strengthening their capacity, around uniting behind a voice to you, you know, uh, uh, support them, have an environment that enables yeah. the work that yeah. they are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, an environment that enables them to, uh, to, to build resiliency you know, yeah. within the yeah. sector that yeah. we are serving. Yeah. And so that turning point really uh, made us to see that tremendous growth I want to assume so. Yeah, but that then, we have, yeah. but then, but then, and now, does that question that we asked at the interview make sense now? Because mm. you are saying philanthropy happens at a community level. Yes. Does that question now make sense? It you? does. Definitely, it does. So. Yeah, it does. Uh, and the reason why I say it does, I always believe. Um, I think. Let me just step back a little bit. The problem that I had with that question, the challenge yeah. that I had with yeah. it was the terminology that was yeah. used. Yeah. <laughs> that is what swept me off, yeah, yeah. you know, my senses. And I was like, yeah, yeah. what is this guy talking about? Yeah. You know? So when I went back and really Googled and like, what, I was like, but this is something that I've done. Yeah. I've written yeah. uh, opinion pieces around this. Yeah. Why yeah. was I struggling with it? But I want to say that um, we have a continent that is rich in resources. At the East Africa region, when the region, when the globe was hit uh, with the COVID pandemic, what I saw in this region was an eye opener. Yeah. And I remember going to Mott Foundation, ICNL, to really look at how we can strengthen community philanthropy in this region, because it was the game changer. It supported governments in a way that was unimaginable. When the government was struggling with bigger things and left the smaller things which were important to livelihoods, communities yeah. stepped in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they really rose mm -hmm. to the occasion. Yeah. And it was the true philanthropic spirit of the continent that was in demonstration. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that um, uh, horizontal philanthropy is the true definition of African 
giving. Yeah. Then, so I also want to, because most membership based organizations yeah. like yourselves yeah. are struggling with the question and notion of membership. Yeah. What is it that you have maybe gotten right or you are doing mm. that makes people want to belong to your network? In other words, what, what, what do you offer your members? Mm. Yeah. Um, I want to answer this with a lot of humility. Yeah. Uh, in that um, uh, networks all over the world are struggling, uh, um, at least in this continent. And um, uh, I inherited an organization that had uh, uh, close to zero dollars in its accounts yeah. uh, when I was taking over. And uh, a few months down the line, we, together with the board and the members, we turned around things. And I don't want to say that there was any geniusness in the process. Yeah. It was the need for us to understand why we have an organization like EAPM and to reposition the organization from the, the perception and the mentality that the members had to what it should really perform. And I'll yeah. just highlight yeah. a few yeah. things. The first yeah. thing that we did was to take the network back to the members. So instead of sitting at the secretariat and making decisions on what we need to do, how we need to do it, and, by, by, uh, and with who, we shifted that question back to the members. And we asked them. So I would literally go to each and every member of the network or of the association then and ask them, how do you want EAPN to support your work? Yeah. And they were part and parcel of the process. They gave me their, their, their opinion around why they even joined the network. And so after that journey, we repositioned the organization. We gave it back to them. So we, I told them that, hey, we can craft a program and a product around that area. So we came up with, you know, the many communities of practice and we had them lead those communities of practice. So one, they felt that they were shaping the agenda of the network, while in the past it was the network shaping, shaping the for, them, for them, you yeah. know, what they need to do. So I allowed them, we allowed them to get the work done yeah. in a manner that they best understand. I think one thing that I have to be very clear on, uh, Prof, is the fact that... Uh, as EAPN, we are not an expert in these issues. And that's why we have this huge group yeah. of people here. They can talk better about collaboration. If you bring in a community of practice around climate change, they are the practitioners. They understand the issues which are affecting this continent around conversations on climate yeah. change. Yeah. So when I, t I told them that I am a platform, I provide you with that opportunity, that space where you can have those conversations we can mobilize organizations who are in the same space where you are so that you can have those conversations. And then it worked. So that was one, taking the network back to the members. But number two was um, around continually doing a needs analysis mm. uh, and, and, and a situational analysis across the region. Things keep changing. In Kenya, our secretariat is in Nairobi. And so sometimes when you are in a country, you tend to be more inclined to the issues which are affecting that country as compared to the other countries that you serve as a network. So we invested in these other countries and just collecting intelligence on what are the issues affecting the philanthropy yeah, space yeah. in those other countries. And the more we addressed those issues, the more interest we got from organizations in those other countries interested in being part of the membership. And it worked for us. The other thing that we did was to just be very open with the members. And we told them, hey, we are broke. <laughs> we don't have money yeah, to run yeah, this organization. Yeah, yeah. The original dream that you had about the East Africa Association of Grant Makers, that dream is dying. But we have hope, a hope in that we have got uh, uh, a team that is willing to drive that agenda, a team that is willing to rekindle that hope, that dream, uh, that you had in creating e yeah. e e EAG uh, then. And so we told them uh, we, can't, um, we can't get work done, we can't create these products if we do not have resources. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw members give to EAPN. 
someone would give a thousand dollars. We had people who, in, uh, who instead of the one thousand dollars membership fee, they added five thousand dollars on top on yeah. annual basis. You know, <laughs> so one would give one thousand as a full member who are grant making entities. We're now giving six thousand yeah. dollars, yeah. and they saw the value. And, and they were never late in remitting their deals. And that gave us a leeway to now connect with the donor yeah, community. Yeah, People yeah. who could then see what we are now doing, the changes which are there, the dreams that were rekindled, and they started investing yeah, back yeah, in the network, yeah, giving yeah. us money. Of course, because um, uh, they had challenges, of course, here and there, the grant started from being like six months grants, one year grants, that transition to two years. Yeah, now we have yeah. people supporting us for five years plus, yeah. you know, and it's because of um, um, those many concerted collective efforts that we developed with our members yeah. that I feel has brought us to where we are. Yeah. An opportunity like the conference that we are having, and, and I want to really believe that um, after the conference, we are going to see a stronger uh, philanthropic movement within the East Africa region. Yeah. And what yeah. we did with the prof, uh, with the conference prof, just to step, step a little bit back, um, um, we, we got a good funding for the conference. And uh, what we did while negotiating for that support which was there uh, was to also ensure that one, there's cross-border knowledge sharing, there's cross-border engagement yeah. within the East Africa region. But then we also bring the other regions of the continent. So we have good representation here from West Africa, good representation from South Africa, yeah. Central Africa. Yeah. I think it's the northern part of the continent yeah. that was not yeah. so well represented, yeah. uh, except um, uh, the Ethiopia, which is part of the East Africa yeah. community, but from the northern part of yeah. the continent. And so we want to not be selfish in terms of um, building philanthropy in the region. We were very intentional on how we can ensure that what is happening within the East Africa region is also replicated, replicated in the other parts of the yeah. continent. Yeah. And yeah. what we are doing now is to see how learnings can be picked from this, opportunities can be created out of this, because we have a strong collaborative arrangement yeah. with the Continental Network, the Africa Philanthropy Network. You saw the Independent Philanthropy Support Association, uh, EPASA, uh, Louise is here. Yeah. So we are trying to see how we can collaboratively strengthen the ecosystem, the infrastructure for giving in this continent. Yeah. And the, yeah. com the conference is, is, is that opportunity that we are having in yeah. our hand yeah. at the moment. Yeah. So that is the journey that we had as EAPN. Uh, uh, so the last piece I was bringing was that connection that we are now having with the other entities. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and uh, we are taking this beyond the continent to the globe. Uh, next month, we will be uh, attending a meeting of association of associations in the U.S. And yeah. they've invited us to share yeah. our success story. Yeah. And yeah. to us, this means a lot. It means the work that we are doing is being seen beyond the region that we are serving, beyond the continent that we are serving. And it's really uh, uh, enabling us to scale up impact yeah. within the philanthropy yeah. space. Yeah, talking about connections with other networks. You play a huge role in the Africa Philanthropy Network, but also uh, within the you know the annual conference that we we established as different partners, and we are we are about to get into our fourth yeah. annual uh, conference that will take place in Dakar, Senegal. Yeah. Uh, what what is the what has been the experience for you taking part in these networks, mm -hmm. but also having been one of the first participants in the annual conference and we are as, as we are saying right now we are seeing the growth we, we see already here in east africa the participation is immense mm -hmm. but as of last year we already saw the growth also in the annual yeah. philanthropy conference and so something is happening yes. uh, i want to just get your reflections uh, as a network but also a participant in some of these yeah. uh, networks yeah um, allow me address that question from two angles because i see it from two angles angle number one is the role that the networks are playing. Yeah. For a very long time, uh, this continent has been viewed by uh, the non, uh, how do I put it, by those who are not residing in this continent as a disjointed continent. Yeah. And for me, the 
the, the conference and the platform that we have been offering, which we are now going to do the fourth one in Dakar, um, 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 is a huge opportunity for us to show that we can unite this continent, to show that we can collaborate behind collective agenda, that we come in a collaborative manner to define and to shape so that we can strengthen the conversations we are having in this continent. Yeah. I see the conference as a huge platform for us to really rally this continent behind uh, the development agenda that we are having, yeah. to really demonstrate the true value in collaboration. I see the conference and the efforts that we are making around it as, a, as, as, as an opportunity for us to shape our own narrative as Africans around yeah. philanthropy. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have a huge, a, a rich narrative uh, that, that I'm so proud about. I am yeah. one person yeah. who is so yeah. proud about our philanthropy practices. You know, we have rich practices in this continent yeah. around giving. Mm -hmm. If you walked into the, uh, from, from uh, as you approached the hotel, uh, you saw the, the teardrops which were communicating the various uh, uh, shapes that philanthropy is taking in this country, from Harambe's, the Ubuntu spirit. Every part of the continent you go to, yeah. there's something that is from our traditional practices. I see the conference as an opportunity for us to nurture those giving traditions and, of course, to shape our own narrative. I always tell people that um, when you... And this was the case in, uh, even in the East Africa region for a very long time. When you asked about philanthropy and philanthropic individuals that someone would mention, the names were very obvious. Yeah. But then I kept on asking them, why are you, are you not engaged in doing ABC? That is philanthropy. But why are we not mentioning you know, yeah. uh, those great individuals that you saw during COVID housing people who had no food to eat? They had hundreds of numbers in their homesteads. So the conference gives us an opportunity to tell those stories. The Kisima platform, the Kisima giving platform, and that's why I love this, it gives us an opportunity to really showcase yeah. what is happening yeah. in the continent. Yeah. And this is what we are taking to the conference. So I see the conference from that angle. What I love about the collaboration that we have demonstrated with uh, the last three conferences, and now we are going to do the fourth one, is the genuine intentional um, approach that we have given it. From mobilization of resources to coming up with the topics and the areas that we need to focus our attention on as a continent, <coughs> to coming up with speakers that we feel and uh, that we feel have the technical expertise to really talk about those issues. Yeah. To me, I see that as a true demonstration of the collective action that we need to catalyze as a continent behind these yeah. uh, conversations yeah. that we are having. But on the other hand, the conference is a demonstration of the growth that is taking place in the continent around philanthropy the interest that these platforms have generated that is catalyzing um, uh, um, the impact that we are seeing around giving in the continent. When we started, you remember the numbers that we were having. Yeah. You saw yeah. the numbers that we had in the last yeah. conference. Yeah. And this was going to be bigger and better. Yeah. You yeah. look at the numbers, you can't believe we are in Zanzibar. Yeah. You may yeah. think we are in Nairobi where the cost of flight is very affordable. Yeah. People yeah. journeyed thousands of kilometers to be here. Yeah. When yeah. we got to the month of April, yeah. Professor, we were fully booked for the conference, yeah. Yeah. you know? And so the conference for me is an opportunity for us to really scale up the influence that we are seeing in the regional levels, at the continental level, within the organizations that are supporting yeah. uh, the journey that we are pursuing with that platform. Yeah. And so it shows me the growth that is there. It shows me the interest which is there. Yeah. And so we have got just more and more years to make it bigger and better. Yeah. 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 So I, I know that you are, you are, you are, you are very much uh, busy, in, I mean, having to manage the conference. So we don't want to hold you uh, for a long period of time. Maybe next time when we do speak to you, we'll get to know Evans, the person. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's also very, very important. Mm. Uh, but what keeps you awake mm. at night? 
what keeps me awake is uh, the fear of failure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I have an interesting story about EAPN that will answer your question. Yeah. When you serve a network, you serve experts. While at EAPN, I do not have the resources to get the best of the best in terms of technical expertise. The members who are part of the network have got the best of the best. For you to serve the best of the best, you've got to really be at par with them. Yeah. So that when you talk, you become relevant. You speak to issues that they identify with. And so what keeps me awake, Professor, is that quest to always meet the needs of the yeah. experts that I serve. Yeah. When I sleep and the world that we are in today, things move at a very fast pace. The philanthropy that is taking place in Kenya is different from what is taking place in Uganda. The contexts are different. The level is different. The challenges are different. Yeah. And so the challenges that we are having, which is our responsibility to help in addressing, really require that leadership of an organization like EAPN has to always be um, embraced with the right knowledge on what is really happening, how we can deal with it, and who we need to bring on board to yeah. deal with it. Yeah. So I think one thing that has, uh, really answers your query is um, the need for the whole of the position that I'm having to really be 100% always connected to the community that we are yeah, serving. Yeah. Otherwise, you send an invite to someone. Someone made me laugh during the reception yesterday. That happens, how does EAPN make these 330 people to be here? Yeah. I struggle to even get four. Yeah. And I really laughed at that question because that is exactly what we went through yeah, at some point yeah, yeah. in our life as an organization. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I told him very a very simple answer, that you've got to invest in building relationships. relationships yeah. That is what will make Professor Moyo to pick your call when he's in the middle of very important yeah, things. Yeah. That is what will make someone to say, hey, if it is EAPN, if it is APN, if it is CAPSI Trust Africa, I'm going to be there. Yeah, yeah. Because they yeah. believe that the course that you are pursuing is genuine, is honest, and is to yeah, their good. Yeah, so right. that whole thing, those many factors around, the need to always be uh, uh, up on our sleeves, just knowing what is happening yeah. in each of these countries, <clears throat> yeah. and getting the right information to deal with the challenges, and connecting with the leadership of the membership yeah, organizations yeah. really has to keep yeah, you awake. Yeah. And I think it's important for us to make this point before mm -hmm. we close that, you know, EAPN and other networks, mm. I mean, you rebranded simply because you wanted to make sure that you're inclusive. Mm. But you also rebranded at a time when uh, the, the Africa Grandmakers Network was also mm. rebranding yeah. because it was yeah. also facing similar, similar challenges. challenges. Yeah. And the idea was that you will be uh, the building blocks yes. of, um, of, yeah. of APN. Yeah. And I'm ending there because I want to make this point that you are, you are definitely proving to be the child that is older than the parent. Because if you think about it, mm -hmm. you are the building blocks for APN, mm -hmm. but you established way before APN. Yes. That means you are yes. older than APN. Yes. Yes. But in terms of the co configurations, you are supposed to be building yes. towards APN. Yes. And so, my friend, I think everyone really realizes the amount of work that you and your team have done yeah. and the amount of progress uh, that you have you know, made over uh, a long period of time. I appreciate uh, it. And I think, you know, it's, it's really at this point where we start talking about you as the leader having to really now pay attention to summit crisis. Yeah. And the summit crisis is when you have achieved so much and you, you, you instead of going further, you now decline. Mm -hmm. So that's the point in leadership where most of us will really, really have to make sure that instead of declining, we actually go further. Yeah. And I want to end it there with yeah. that challenge because yeah. I know that uh, it's something that will further keep you awake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Evans, thank you so for, much. for joining us. Appreciated. Uh, and and uh, keep up with the good work. Yeah. Uh, this you. is important for the continent. Thank you so much. Sam. Thank you so much. Great. That was Evans Okinyi, the director of the uh, East Africa Philanthropy Network. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time.
You've been listening to the Capsi podcast series, Conversations on African Philanthropy.